and start then i'd like to now call the june 2nd 2000 or 2020 longmont city council session it's a regular session to order could we please start with a roll call of course mayor bagley i'm here, here. <laughs> council members christensen here thank you council member Hidalgo fairing here council member martin here council member peck here council member rodriguez here council member waters here mayor you have a quorum all right great uh, uh let's go ahead and say the pledge my favorite part of the online web meetings uh council council member Hidalgo fairing do you want to start us off please sure i'll do it like with my my class right hand over your heart all right good flag. good ready nope. begin <laughs> I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the, to the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, of America. And to, the and to the republic for which it stands, and one nation, nation, nation as a God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. And justice for all. all. Mind my pauses. <laughs> well, well, well done. Well done. All right. Quick reminder by the chair. Anyone wishing to speak during first call, public invited to be heard. Item seven. Um, we'll need to watch the live stream of the meeting. Instructions for how to call in to provide comment will be given during the meeting, which I have now lost, but anyway, um, and displayed on the screen at the appropriate times during the meeting. Comments are limited to three minutes per person and each speaker will be asked to state their name and address for the record prior to proceeding with their comments. Um, there are no approval of minutes. Do we have any agenda revisions or submission of documents? All right, good sign. City manager report. Let's move on to COVID-19 update and emergency items for consideration. Oh, sorry, council member Hidalgo Faring. Trying to unmute myself. So um, actually I had sent it, I had uh, Maria sent an email and it was later this afternoon. Um, so you may not have had an opportunity to see it, but I did want to bring forward a statement to, um, to receive approval and adoption. Um, in regard to what has been um, world uh, nation events that have um, that have hit our our nation and our community as well. Um, so I have a statement of solidarity in response to the killing of George Floyd and the protests um, that followed. So I would like to bring forward the statement uh, for approval. Uh, can I read it? Um, you could, but what we'd like to do is put it on the next agenda and then we'll go ahead and vote on it? Well, I would like to read it before we vote on it. That's fine, we can do that. Okay, so I will do that. So the recent killings of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor by police officers launching a nationwide movement of protests and sadly riots have weighed heavily in our hearts and minds. We condemn the brutal death of George Floyd and the killings of so many more black Americans because of racial discrimination by the very people sworn to protect us. We reject the actions of these officers, of these particular officers, who took it upon themselves to be the judge, jury, and executioners. We recognize the trauma communities of color historically experienced due to ongoing police, police brutality. In effect, exacerbating continued fear and distress of law enforcement. We are a nation of grief, grieving over the loss of such lives, of lives such as George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor in just these last few weeks. As you, your elected officials, it is our responsibility to address instances of injustice. We must make a commitment to lead with compassion and the resiliency needed to build a more equitable community. Longmont City Council is committed in prioritizing racial equity and dismant dismantling systematic, systemic racism that divides and destroys communities. We support our community members' efforts to participate in peaceful protesting. We stand in solidarity with these protesters and encourage the community to remain focused on the purpose of these demonstrations, which is to advocate and fight for racial, social, and economical justice. So, so that's, that's the statement. I'm open to revisions, but um, I ask that we adopt this. All right, why don't you go ahead and make a motion? Do you want to make a motion? Yes. All right. Who? Just say, all right. So she's moved yeah, all second. I, Councilmember, I, I, Councilmember Christensen. Yes, I, uh, I second that. 
I think that's a wonderful statement. I read it earlier and uh, I think, uh, well, it certainly reflects my view. Thank you. All right, Harold, I mean, can we put this on the agenda item for just the next meeting rather than regular meeting? Is that okay? Yes, we'll, we'll get that done. It'll be a week from, really okay. two weeks from today. All right, just as long as we get it on quick. Council Member Waters? Thanks, Mayor Begley. Um, I didn't know that we were going to get an email or a, a, a proposed council statement from uh, any of our council colleagues. And I, and, and I don't want to have dueling statements. I think council member Douglas hearing statement is, uh, is uh, very eloquent. Uh, but, I but I do have my own statement I'm going to make. Um, I'll wait to the end of the meeting. And I just want to say it now. I don't, I don't mean it to be dueling messages. I just feel an obligation to not be a si silent ally at this point in time. I'll wait to the end of the meeting. And, I'm, and, and I have no doubt I'll get behind the, the, the collective statement. But, um, but I feel an obligation to, to be clear with this committee where I stand. And I'll choose to do that at the end of the meeting, just so everybody understands. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Let's go ahead and vote. All in favor of uh, placing Councilmember Lago Faring's uh, statement onto the next council meeting to be voted upon and accepted by council, say aye. 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 Opposed? Say nay. All right. The motion carries unanimously. All right. Anybody else? And th by the way, Councilmember uh, Idago Faring, thank you very much. Uh, well stated, and uh, look forward Welcome. to voting and supporting that. Okay. Um, thank you. All, all right. Harold, COVID nineteen update. Unmute, Harold. Harold, unmute. Yep. Wrong button. Uh, the city manager's comments are going to have three things tonight. Um, first, council voted last week on changes uh, regarding the housing authority, and I just wanted to let you know where we were on that. Um, so uh, the housing authority on Thursday did vote um, for me to be the executive board member. We have started working on that. Uh, just to let you know, we placed Chick Tracy DeFrancesco in the office, uh, in the housing authority office to work with Kathy and Karen. You may have remember Tracy from the work that she's done on the mobile home program that we've had and the work that she did um, in replacing mobile homes, not only through federal funds, but working actually with Eric, who's on tonight in terms of undocumented individuals and making sure they had the same access to housing that others did who qualified for that. So we have a lot of, I've worked directly with Tracy on that issue. Um, Karen's leading the residential and organizational culture piece. Um, she's doing that in conjunction with Michelle Waite, Armin, and Eliberto. Kathy's taking the lead on financial development and the programs there. Just so you know, Friday I was there and met with as many of the office staff as I could and then had to move back to the, um, the Civic Center to do our afternoon calls with the entire organization. I'm gonna be spending more time there. Um, Michelle, Carmen, and Karen have um, they were at Aspen Meadows uh, this afternoon. Um, they've also been meeting with many of the um, managers of the facilities and having conversations as we continue digging into this situation. Um, and we're gonna be touching base later this, later this week so I can get briefed and we can move into the following steps. So I just wanted to let you know, um, we've been actively engaged um, in different areas at the Housing Authority since you all voted on, on that um, last week. Second thing um, that I want to talk about is um, a, a short COVID-19 update today because we also have Mike Butler here. I know there's been some questions that have come to council via emails and I wanted Mike to touch on those. And so Mike and I, Mike will do most of the talking and I may jump in for some commentary. But at least where we are today, um, you all may have know that, may, you all may know that the governor has extended the safer at home orders um, for until the end of June. I think they call it now safer at home in the wide open spaces, Colorado or something like that. Um, specifically, this had a lot to do with outdoor recreation and recreational activities. Um, they are asking for feedback on guidance regarding swimming pools and team sports. And so I have staff working on that so we can send that into the state. Once those orders are issued, 
we're going to really need to look at the impacts to our facilities to determine what the next steps will look like. Um, specifically, we've talked to you all about our budget issues. So we're going to be evaluating really um, the numbers and what we're allowed to bring into facilities and what that looks like from a financial component because we also have to be very mindful that we don't increase the budget deficit that we have once we have some of the once we understand those orders and what that means. So we're going to be digging into it as we get more information. As you all know, the um, restaurant expansion process, we talked about what we were able to do internally. That seems to be going fairly well. I think we have nine applicants that have come into the system. We have around four or five that are through the process, which is in the process is going pretty quickly in terms of that action. And it's really great to see. Um, you can design these processes and the test is how fast people go through them. I know Sandy was talking to me about some jurisdictions. They've been in there longer and haven't turned anything out. Um, kudos to Don, Michelle, Judge, Legal, everybody that's in there in terms of pulling them in the, in the process and pushing them out. So that seems to be going pretty well. Um, we're still trying to understand how all these orders potentially impact the 4th of July fireworks, um, but we have gotten more clarity and we know we're going to be canceling all other events through July, um, which does include Rhythm on the River and the 4th of July Longmont Symphony concert, just based on the amount of people that are coming into one location in the grouping. So I'm letting you all know that we're going to be getting that out to the community via press releases. And then we're also um, doing the same with other concerts that we have. Um, and now one of, what I wanted to do is introduce Eric Ozimpa from the Community Foundation. He has a presentation of, uh, for the Council on the Strongmont Fund. And when we talk about everything that's going on, and I think no matter what it is, one of the things that always amazes me is how well Longmont can come together during times like this and how well we work together. And what Eric's going to talk to you about is really a testament in terms of bringing folks from multiple organizations from throughout the community together to really work uh, to benefit um, our business community and the grant processes that we were talking about. Eric, are you ready to go? Hi, I'm Harold. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, thank you to mayor and council for allowing me to present. Um, I, yep, thank you very much, Don or Susan, for putting that up. I appreciate it very much. I just wanted to give a special acknowledgement to Susan and Don for actually helping get these meetings set up and helping me look a little bit better as far as getting the presentation up there. Um, so regarding the Strong Mud Fund, this is just a brief update that I want to provide you. And of course, you can ask any questions you want at any time, because that's our role at the Law Mud Community Foundation. So if we can go to the next slide. I don't think I can go to the next slide, but. One moment, my mouse is being bad. <laughs> Thanks, Susan. Thank you very much. So just a brief recap about the Strongmont Fund, the city's economic partners formed the COVID-19 Business Response Fund with the goals of capital communication and education and really where the Longmont community fits in, fits in is the capital piece, if you will. We are the partner to hold the grant funds, any private donations and facilitate the Strongmont Fund granting process. The funds are comprised of city funds, uh, DDA funds and donations from the broader community. And I'm proud to say that currently we have about $275,000 in grant funds available that will um, cover quite a bit of, I shouldn't say cover quite a bit of need because there's a ton of need out there, but I'm, I'm really thrilled with the amount that we've seen already and the generosity in our community so far. We go to the next slide. Is that not the next slide? No, I'm sorry. I just talked about this. Forgive me. That should be slide three. Hmm. Well, let's go to the next one then. Sorry. Are 
Are, is the screen not changing for you? No, it's, it's, it's not, not changing. Yeah. Oh, so. I'm on pause for some reason. Whoops. One more time. <laughs> I can keep talking too. So the eligibility, um, we're getting back to the to slide three there, but um, eligibility for the grant process was that you had to complete a business assessment. Um, there you go. It had, had to be a non-home based business with a physical address within the city of Longmont, locally owned and operated 25 or fewer full-time equipment FTE employees, in an operation since January 1st, 2020 or before. Next slide, please. You need to possess an active city of Longmont sales and use tax license and be in good standing with city permits, licenses, fees as of March 1st, 2020. Experience closure, dramatic reduction in operation or loss of revenue due, due to public orders related to the COVID-19 public health crisis. Grant reporting is required of all entities that receive funding. And in fact, I'll talk about two cycles of, of reporting that we will be um, throwing out to the community later on this year. Next slide, please. So just a brief application um, summary. We had 179 applications submitted. Um, $1.6 million in requests is just phenomenal, the amount of money that people have requested. And the average request is about 9,135. You might say that we were allowing people to apply for $10,000, but there are some people or businesses in, in the community that actually did not request the full amount. So hence, that's why the average request is $9,000. Next slide. Apologize for the vibrant colors here, but essentially you get a, a sense of who applied for the Strongmont Fund. Um, the, this is kind of our before survey, if you will. This, this information was collected during the application process itself. And our hope is, is that we would be able to match this with the post survey information. So once we get those reports, we can kind of link up and see, you know, what their estimated customers are, um, post um, kind of safer at home, if you will, number of full-time employees and gross revenue, et cetera. If you can move on forward, Susan, thank you. And then we did also ask the applicants to identify if they're minority owned, veteran owned, women owned, or locally owned and operated. Obviously, they have to be locally owned and operated if they're to be applicable. But of course, we had some that did apply for that, but they did not fall into that locally owned and operated. For that green slice of segment, we also asked within the minority owned, if you can go to the next slide, Susan, um, what identifying minority they identify with, and you'll see here a, a pie chart of 47% or 48% Hispanic, Latina, Latinx, Asian American, African American, a nice diversity as far as the applicants that we receive from the Strongmont Fund application. Next slide, please. And just briefly, the committee um, of eight members made up of the community, um, we were able to corral and herd them and get them to do a really quick review. The deadline for the applications was May 20th, and we were able to review applications within a couple of days. Um, they each got a segment of the 179. They didn't review all 179 themselves. We actually parsed them into cohorts, and um, they made recommendations for the first round of 23 recommendations or roughly $230,000. Six were non-compliant with city regulations, that eligibility requirement that I told you about earlier but they do have until Wednesday at five to fix their issues. We anticipate the Longmont Community Foundation anticipates the checks for the first round will go out later this week. The second round will follow shortly and two progress reports that I alluded to earlier are due August 31st and December 31st. And we hope to get some, um, some data to share with you as well as the rest of the community. And that is it for my brief report. Thank you very much, Eric. Do we have any, um, other than uh, just a hearty thank you for acting so quickly to help our local businesses? Uh, very impressive. Um, 23 is a big number uh, given given the time and, and the resources available. So thank you. You did great. So, Thanks. All right. If there's nothing else, um, then make, it, make sure that we get on record that Councilmember Peck give you two thumbs up. So <laughs> we're good. All right. Yeah, Mayor. Yep.
And I just wanted to also say, I know anytime we've hit one of these situations, Eric's always there to jump right beside us and work through it. So I wanted to give a personal thank you to Eric and, and the work he does. He's always there to help us fight through the sticky situation. So thanks, Eric. I really appreciate thanks, it. Harold. I really appreciate it too. Thank you for the comment. All right. Do we have Chief Butler here? Is, is it his turn now? Yep. It's Chief Butler's turn now. All right. And uh, let me just preface. I think I speak on behalf of everybody that this is this is of utmost concern right now, given Councilmember Hidalgo Faring's uh, comments and proposed motion, the emails and the concerns. And uh, right now, I know that there's a group of citizens on Main Street um, actively uh, protesting, etc. So I'm, we're, we're all anxious to hear what you have to say, Public Safety Chief Butler. All right, thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, City Council. I'm Mike Butler. I am the Public Safety Chief. Um, you know, what happened in Minneapolis last week, you know, I haven't been able to come up with good words to try to figure out how to describe it, how, how it makes me feel. Um, I can tell you that people within our police department are just kind of shaking and hanging their heads. Those who, those who are um, hired to protect and serve the community, um, for something like this to happen is, is beyond at some level comprehension. We all saw the video, it's incredibly hard to watch. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure what else to say about it. It's, it's just moved all of us and and none of us, I can tell you in my conversations within the police department, none of us can figure out how that, how, how could somebody do that? And you know, you gotta understand too folks that um, this is my profession, the profession I've been in for 40 plus years. We work with a lot of people within the police department that have been doing uh, the service of, of providing police services to our community for for decades, and it's kind of it's a black mark for us. Um, and and um, it's again, and I've said for years that the actions of one police officer can upset the equilibrium of an entire community. Well, it seems like the, these actions upset the equilibrium of an entire country. And so here we are. Um, and I know there's a way out of it. Uh, I know that we're gonna be able to work through it. But I also wanted to come tonight to talk a little bit about what's going on in Longmont. And this is, I don't know what kind of time I have here. I could, I could talk for hours um, in terms of what we have going, uh, in terms of what we've done around hiring practices, how we train, um, how we supervise the culture, how we've, what kind of culture we've developed, the expectations our officers have uh, in terms of what they do and don't do. Um, the architecture of the organization um, is a piece of this as well in terms of, of ensuring that our officers feel good about their position within the organization. So, um, and then the other part of this, of course, are, are certain policies, use of force policies and what we do with, with that. Um, and so I'm just gonna start and I'm just gonna spend a little time on each of those areas. And then I welcome questions, I welcome comments, um, any concerns you might have. Some of you have ridden along with our police officers. So I, I'll, just, I'll just start with recruitment and hiring practices. Um, so we, we we reformulated our, our what we call our, our profile that we look for in, in a police officer a while back, and we're always refining it. It's always something we're kind of trying to up the ante in terms of the kind of people we're looking for. But Longmont has the reputation, perhaps more than any other police department in the state of Colorado, of the difficulty it is for anybody to become a police officer in Longmont because of our screening and the and the uh, serve and the screening criteria that we use, and so and and the other thing I want to say about that is, you know, we have a lot of police officers who want to um, move into Longmont uh, from other cities, from not only around the state, from around the country, and I will tell you that 
about one out of seven out of eight of those what we call lateral entries, people who are currently police officers, don't fit our profile because it is so different um, than, than in many other places. We really place a tremendous amount of emphasis on people um, who want to be a police officer and their capacity to connect and their capacity to develop relationships. This job is all about that. We don't hire lone cowboys, lone cowgirls. We do not hire people um, who uh, just want to kind of be by themselves and work by themselves. We want to we want to hire and who don't want to connect with the community. We we hire people who do want to connect, who can develop relationships, who are very predisposed to, to doing that. Our motto is policing in partnership with the people, and so those people we hire. Um, are we want them to be able to work in partnership with the people. And the kind of, the, the way they do their work, the way a police officer does their work is that they are assigned specific areas of the community and that, and that assignment lasts for a while. And their responsibility is to develop relationships with uh, whatever exists in their community, whether it's businesses, whether it's neighborhoods, whether it's churches, schools, whatever that might look like. And so they are, that, is their, that is their role and that's somewhat of their assignment. And so we're very, very particular about who we bring on. And by the way, we have citizens who participate in our hiring processes. We even have high school students that sit on our hiring panels to determine whether or not the person that they see as a high school person, um, if they want that person as a police officer. And so, the other part of this that um, some of you might know about is that just about everything that we do within the police department, there's community, people from the community involved, uh, whether it's strategic planning, whether it's hiring, promotions, transfers to other assignments, all kinds of different kinds of work that they're doing. They've been involved in our strategic planning process. Our strategic, one of our strategic planning processes included over a thousand people. The vast, vast majority of them were from our community. And, and it took about 18 months uh, to do that process. And so we wanted who we were, how we were, are, and what we do and how, and, and what we do and how we do it uh, to be a reflection of the voice of people in this community. And so we spent a considerable amount of time uh, making sure that people's voices within this community count in terms of who we are uh, and what we do and how we do it. And they are constantly working uh, right next to us on an ongoing basis. I know I've, I've talked to council before about, about that level of transparency. They're always walking the hallways. They're always working with us in some form or fashion. And so, that's a big, big, big piece for us. The other thing that in terms of their involvement, and I think you're all aware is that we have a citizen review panel. Um, any allegation of misconduct that comes through that is investigated by our professional uh, standards unit is reviewed by uh, five community members. And those community members are selected by the city manager. I have nothing to do with that. And, and so those five community members um, make recommendations regarding the fairness, the objectivity, thoroughness, completeness of an investigation. And then they also make recommendations in terms of should the case be sustained? Is there, is there enough evidence to show that the officer is responsible for that misconduct? Or should it be not sustained or unfounded or exonerated? And so our citizens have quite a bit of input into who we are again and what we do. But our hiring practices are critically important. The other thing I want to say about that is that we do a tremendous amount of research and background investigation to determine if any of our applicants have ever used violence, an ounce of violence to try to solve a problem. And if they have, they're rejected. They're immediately rejected. The other thing that I want to say is that um, 
we, the average age of the person we hire is somewhere between 30 and 32 years of age uh, as a police officer. And so they're not people just right out of college. They have life experience. They've had other jobs. We've hired school teachers. Uh, we've hired ministers. We've hired social workers. Um, and so those are the kinds of folks that we tend to kind of that gravitate towards uh, the application process in long run. And so, but if there is any kind of violence in our background, um, we reject them. Um, and so that is very, very clear for us. Um, so maybe I'll just stop there real quickly and ask if there's any, if there are any questions around what I've said so far. Uh, the only comments. Well, first of all, Chief, Chief uh, the, the question, had you not said what you said, was going to be, one, what are we going to do to assure that, what changes will we make to make sure that the George Floyd situation does not happen here? And two, um, if, if the answer is nothing, what have we done to make sure it doesn't happen? So thank you very much. Um, but I did get some, we, we got some emails today asking where can they find the information on the Citizens Review panel? Is that online somewhere? Well, I I don't know if it's um, online, but if if you want to refer those folks to me, I can make sure they get a copy of of that information. You okay. can refer them to Don and Michelle because I know when when we did the recruiting the last time, um, they put that notice out. Could you just um, could you e could you email it to me? Because uh, rather yep. than I just if you give we'll it have to me, Don we'll have Don and Michelle send right. it out to you. We'll, we'll email it to the entire council. Great, Dr. Waters. No, I was just signaling we would all like that and, and here oh, it's on. We all want it. We all want it. Yeah. Council Member Dougal Faring. I have this. It's the summary of your um, the diversion program summary. And one of the things, and I did respond to a constituent who asked, what are we doing? I know in our own personal experience, um, the core team had actually helped with an incident with my son who's um, diagnosed autism. And uh, it, was, it, it, was, it was a game changer for him. And I had the opportunity to share that. I do not throw comments out lightly in regards to justice and racial equity, so, um, unless I truly believe in the work that, that they're doing. And I truly believe in the work and the, um, that you're doing with GRIP, with our students um, who are at risk for gang, with our students who are at risk with mental health and disabilities and how the police interact with them. We've had, even though they've been very um, strained in you know, instances with my son, um, we've had very positive interactions with law enforcement in helping talk him off the ledge and help and help us get the resources we need. So I truly thank you. And I would really like if you could they'll explain more about those. Sure, I, I will. Those are programs, you know, they, go ahead. Uh, Polly has a. Go ahead, Polly, sorry. Okay. Um, uh, I know, Chief, uh, thank you for coming tonight, Chief Butler, and talking. It's very, very timely, of course. We're all in a state of uh, rage and disgust and anger. Um, <laughs> so it's very good. To, I, I've lived many different places, and I've experienced a few different police officers, I mean, police departments. And I know that we have a good police department in contrast to some that I've experienced. And I just wanted to, uh, I know you could talk about this forever, but I just wanted to point out that Longmont is really unique in that we have, uh, the police department has started the Angel Initiative, which um, helps get people off of drugs. It started the Restorative Justice, which works with the court system to uh, make sure that people who, teenagers who make a mistake don't get stuck in the uh, justice system and in just going to jail and ruining their lives, they get a chance to rethink it and make things right. Uh, I know that you have um, people who come around with you who, when you realize there's a um, mental health issue, you have somebody there who comes with you 
That's incredibly helpful. You have a homeless team who works with people who are homeless who try to get them to the right resources. And uh, you really, uh, I know you've worked on opioids since um, I mentioned that to you years ago and you were already on it. And um, you've done work with not hiring people, as you say, who already have problems and making them part of the police force. And um, you really, I think this is a really excellent example of community policing that really you will, there's a commitment to um, serve and protect. And I wanna thank you for that. All right. So uh, you, hit ahead, on a, you hit on a couple of things there that I think are important. The programs are kind of results of some of our philosophy and policy. You know, it's, for a while, I've always, I've, I have felt that our criminal justice system is way too prominent in our society and our communities in terms of trying to, in terms of its responsibility for solving social and health issues. And, and so, you know, it, it, for those of you who have spoken with me in the past at length, you know I'm not necessarily a fan of trying to pass ordinances to fix health or social issues whether it's at the city level, the state level, national level, whatever that might look like. I don't think we can pass laws and stiffen penalties and, and think it's gonna be an insurance policy that's gonna protect us from the human condition. It just doesn't, it's never happened. And, and it won't happen in the future. And so what we have to get good at is having great conversations around these social issues and get out of the one size fits all quick fix kind of way of seeing, here's how we fix this particular social issue. Because we can fill up the jails uh, or we can, we can arrest people and we know we're not gonna be able to arrest ourselves out of these issues. So we did our best and we're still doing this to try to minimize uh, the enforcement role or in the invoking of the criminal justice system within our community by putting programs in place like restorative justice, like the ANGEL initiative, like LEAD, the addiction, uh, the, heart, the, uh, the, um, the, the model that we work with for uh, folks struggling with addiction as well, and like the CORE program, um, the uh, co-responder program. And of course, there's a program called Rewind for Kids that operates as well out of, out of the city. And so, we're not done yet, but we've put a lot of programs in place that we believe are more effective than, than the enforcement aspect of things. And so, and so there's a lot, of, a lot more I could say about that, but if you have questions, but I just, you brought all those up, Polly, and that's fine. Uh, but that's why we're doing those things is because we do not believe the criminal justice system is the answer. And so when you look at this country, and you look at what's going on with police departments around the country. And I'm familiar with a lot of police departments. I've been asked to do a lot of speaking around the country over the last few years around this. The vast majority of police departments are still stuck in the enforcement mode. They're kind of designed and geared for enforcement. And so, and so when an officer goes into a neighborhood and and, 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 and I will say this, that oftentimes when, when we encounter these social or health issues, which by the way, are, is a significant part of any police department's business. Um, unfortunately, the, the communities, the economically disadvantaged, the socially marginalized or disenfranchised communities don't have as many options. And so they don't have options for treatment for addiction. They don't have options for treatment for mental health. Uh, and so when they call the police, the police come and their role is enforcement. And, they, and a lot of police departments around the country, if you want to talk about police reform, have to figure out how to get out of that, how to, how to move forward in terms of just their role being only in enforcement. And, and so because these are the very communities, these are the very neighborhoods and communities that really need police in a different kind of way not just to enforce. And so, so when we walk, when we go into a neighborhood or a family or a certain part of the community, many people know already that we're not necessarily there to just enforce the law. 
that we're there to figure out how we can bring different kinds of solutions to the table. And so that's, that's out there in our community already. Not everybody knows about that. And sometimes Longmont, by people who don't know, get lumped in to the whole police phenomena. So I know that Joan has a question. Go ahead, Joan. You have to hit the mute button. There you go. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mike, for showing up tonight. This is really informative. But I, I do have a question as to how what the disciplinary action is for police officers in Longmont. For example, the accused uh, officer who uh, actually strangled uh, Floyd. It, it seems like he had a lot of disciplinary actions along the way. And at some point, the question is, why is he still on the police force? Um, what is Longmont's protocol uh, for disciplinary action? Um, and would that policeman have been on the street if he were what, a policeman yeah. in Longmont? Without, without, without hesitation, absolutely not. And we do have uh, several checks and balance systems in place um, for, for that. And so if, if there is an officer that um, has a propensity for committing allegations of misconduct, they don't last long. They just okay. don't. And, and by the way, I know that some things have come out about unions being a detractor for uh, police administrators to be able to discipline. We don't have that problem in Longmont. And, and I won't go through all the circumstances, but over the last couple of years, Harold knows about these cases. Um, we've been able to terminate five police officers um, not, not for anywhere thing anywhere near what happened in Minneapolis, of course, um, and, and, and essentially with um, the blessing of our F, our Fraternal Order of Police organization. So our relationship is good with them. And you will find, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to a police chief um, in other parts of the country, and they'll, they will say something like, I fired the same guy three times. Um, and, and, and because of the either civil service commission or because of the appeal process, they're able to come back and get their jobs back. That's mm. never happened here in Longmont. And so it's kind of a, it's kind of a, it's a real, it's a real powerful and a real dynamic in a lot of police departments around the country in terms of kind of the union protection they have. And I'm not saying that's what happened in Minneapolis because I don't know for sure, but I do know that Minneapolis has a pretty strong police union. And the officer that was involved in this has 17 or 18 prior allegations of misconduct. Um, that's unheard of. Um, mm -hmm. And I know that that's something that Minneapolis is gonna have to try to figure out how to answer uh, in terms of what happened. But in terms well, of our, yeah, go ahead. I wanted to kind of jump in and help with this too. So um, obviously we have processes that we have to go through. And in many cases, I'm the final appeal. Uh, but there have been cases where my, I get involved earlier, mm -hmm. uh, just based on what Mike's challenged with and dealing with in these processes. And, and so, yeah, to Mike's point, what he didn't say is, yeah, this individual wouldn't have lasted that long. Um, I know there's been cases that we've dealt with where it's been swift when, when we've seen issues. But the thing I wanted to <clears throat> add to everything that Mike is saying is I've, I've had the advantage of being part of three different organizations, three different police departments, multiple chiefs. And the thing that I learned early on, um, and I had the ability to, to cut my teeth on some bad events. Um, Departments don't get this way overnight. This occurs over long periods of time, and it's really embedded within the culture of the department and how they approach and deal with people. Um, and there are things that Mike and I talk about on a regular basis. One of those things is use of force. And the reason why, and Mike knows this, the reason why I'm always asking him about those questions is because what I've learned is that is a good early warning system based on the experience that I've had 
in terms of are you seeing shifts and are you seeing departments approach things in different ways? And I will tell you, what I see based on our numbers versus what I've seen in other places and what my colleagues have seen, it's drastically different in terms of use of force. Um, but we pay particular attention to that and it's embedded in things that you may think are simple, that people may think are simple, but it's when do you have a high speed chase? You know, we have rules about when and how we do that. And it's as simple as some of those directives that really start setting the base of the culture in terms of how you deal with this. And those are the things that I try to watch out for in our conversations. And it's different here, I've said it. I've said many times, the way we approach things, is it's different. Um, do we always hit a home run and knock it out of the park? No, we, we, we obviously know from a couple of years ago, we make mistakes, but I think the difference is we own those mistakes and we try to make improvements as we're moving forward. But I wanted to give some perspectives to Mike's answers in the sense that we do have ongoing conversations about this so that we can see if things are changing. So we, we monitor, uh, just in, add, in adding building onto that, we monitor every single one of our officers um, use of force. If someone uses force within our department, there's multiple layers of review, including my office. Um, and every officer knows that that is going to be reviewed. And now you throw in every one of our officers now wears a body worn camera. It's so easy to go back to that camera to see what happened. Uh, and does the report that the officer write kind of line up with what we see in the video. While we didn't necessarily need those, the body-worn camera does serve as another check and balance and for other purposes as well in terms of use of force. I know Marsha has a question. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm just going to ask it. Um, uh, Chief Butler, I think you have absolutely been talking about the wrong, the right things here. I've gotten a lot of ants of letters that I think have been, um, well, I think they've been um, written off of a checklist of bad things that police departments do, because a lot of them, in my experience, don't have anything to do with this police department. Um, but a demand I keep hearing is we need to demilitarize our police department. And my response to that is what? You know, I've seen militarized police departments. Um, but could you speak to that just a little about the role of, of heavy gear and, and stuff we inherited from the army and all of that stuff in this police department? Yeah, uh, of course. So. You know, sometimes you see these the, our officers wear these vests with all their equipment um, on their upper torso versus their belt. And one of the things that people don't know is that they do that to, to save their backs, that it's actually easier on their body to carry 20 to 25 pounds of you know, with their handcuffs, their, their firearms, Whatever it's going to be, um, that they, they it's e and they're bulletproof vest, by the way, uh, that it's easier to carry on their upper torso. And so it kind of looks bigger, but it's actually something that we use for ergonomic in terms of people being able to uh, save their backs. Uh, and so just so you know that that when you see that, that's that's the case. Um, and so for police officers who are in uniform on a regular day in day out basis, carrying that on their hips and their back can be, um, for many of them, it, it can be debilitating. And so we went to that form of carrying our equipment. Uh, we don't have, we have very little um, military equipment in Longmont. We do have a mobile command center that we use. That, that's a big, big RV looking vehicle but it's not a military vehicle. And, and so I understand that sense of demilitarization, the look that it might have. At one point years ago, our, 
our officers were all wearing kind of fatigue, the you know, army fatigues. They're not wearing those uniforms anymore. We've changed a lot of that up, you know? And so while sometimes the look of a police officer in a uniform can make them look like someone who's in the military, what well, we don't act like the military. And what we do in the community is much different than what, a, of course, the military would do. So we've done what we think we need to do to sort of demilitarize. Um, and in fact, we never got that kind of military orientation to a great degree anyway. And so that's not who we are. That's not what we do or how we do it. And so, but occasionally I have to, I have to talk about SWAT. And I know that that's something that people see as, as an aggressive kind of police tactic. Well, our team, what it's about is it's a, it's a safety measure. Uh, we have a team that works well together. And what I can't discount, what none of us can discount, are the circumstances that police encounter uh, with people who are carrying weapons and sometimes uh, very powerful weapons. And, and, uh, and so, and, and are very aggressive with us um, in that regard. And so our goal when we do activate our, our SWAT team is to ensure the safety of everybody, the safety of our officers, the safety of the person that might be aggressive towards us, the safety of any hostage, the safety of people in the community. And, and I will tell you in the years I've been here, our, our, our special weapons and tactical team have never had to shoot anybody. And so even though they have these kinds of, uh, they have this equipment and tools they have, they've never used any kind of lethal force. And I think that's a testament to, to the great teamwork um, and to the great skills that they have. And so this is, this is a tough area, and especially in today's environment to talk about because Sometimes people want your police departments to be, you know, they want them to be, they want them to look the other way sometimes. And, and, and sometimes we can't, and well, we can't ever look the other way. But so we have to activate certain kinds of tools and equipment in order to get the job done as safely as possible. So that's the best answer I have for you, Marsha, on that one. I think that's a good answer. Thank you. All Tim. right, Tim, go ahead, Tim. Thanks, Mayor Magley. Mike, thanks. I had my thanks to you for uh, spending your time with us this evening, and uh, more importantly, the thanks to you for a, a literally a lifetime of service uh, in this field and to this community. And um, I, I hope the whole world is listening to this conversation, actually, and and what policing should look like in communities across the country. So um, it would be helpful for me and maybe others to have, to, I have two questions. The first one is helpful for me and others to have some idea of the variety and the number of complaints that you or Harold and the review board deal with during the course of the year, right? Is that a big number, small number? What does that look like? First question. Second question, since you're about to turn the page and move into the next chapter of your life, it'd be helpful to know for council members, I think at least for me, what what's the what are you going to leave in the letter to your successor? What are the areas for the greatest potential for growth or improvement? Given all the good work that's going on, it ain't perfect. And if I know you, I, th there's not a doubt in my mind you you're going to leave some recommendations in the areas where that we need to focus and where we have the greatest potential to improve. I'd be curious what those are. Yeah, first question, Tim. Numbers of cases. Um, I'm, I'm happy to say that we don't get a lot of citizen complaints. We just don't. And by the way, we set up a process years ago. Uh, it's called SOMOS. And SOMOS means we are in, in Spanish. And um, Latino leaders and staff from police set this up so that people could actually go to people like, if they wanted to file a complaint against anyone in the police, they could go to someone like Carmen Ramirez, or they could go to El Comité, or they could go to the R Center, or they could go to St. John's Church. So they don't, it's, it can be rather intimidating to come to the police department and say, I want to file a complaint against one of your officers. So 
we made it easy for people if they want to file a complaint to do that. I wanted to say that because the number of complaints we get are few. We average maybe six to seven allegations of misconduct a year. And I, I want to say maybe two or three of those are typically car accidents. We've had one excessive or two excessive force complaints um, in the last three years. And both of those were unfounded by the Citizens Committee. And so I think that's a testament to the culture. It's a testament to the people that we have in our force. Uh, it's a testament to the training. Um, and it's a, but mainly it's a testament to our staff. It's a testament to our officers and the people and the kind of people they are. So I would encourage anyone in the community, if anyone's watching this, to ride along with us and and to um, and to get a firsthand view. Um, it's not like TV, uh, and it may not be what you see on the news. Um, and I and I know you're going to be pleasantly surprised. Um, and so there's a lot of ways of being in, able to interact with us, engage with us. We welcome that on a regular basis. And anyone's welcome for the next month to call me and I will figure out how to uh, get you involved. So that's the answer to your first question, Tim. Um, so here, here's I have this. I have expressed this to some folks, you know, here the. Our, our police profession in the eyes of many seem, seems broken. And I'm not gonna say it's not unbroken. It, there is a brokenness about it. And, and, and these latest incidents have kind of highlighted that brokenness in, in terms of what's going on. And there's a part of me that says, you know what, I don't wanna leave this because I think I can help with that. But then there's also a part of me, the bigger part of me says, Good luck to the next person, so to speak. So that's kind of where that's where I'm landing. But you know, the the person that is going to be overseeing this, um, actually, that person, he's an internal person. I don't know how much we haven't put anything out there publicly uh, about that, Harold. If you want to talk about that, fine. So based on COVID, we have an interim person right now, um, just because of travel and everything else. And so that interim person is. Um, Rob Spinlow, um, and then we'll move through the processes once we actually can have conversations um, and get feedback. So here's my here's my main here would be my main advice or my a thought. When you have people who are have this incredible anomalous authority to take people's freedom away, and we live in a society where individual rights are paramount, and then they give police departments this authority to take people's freedom away or justifiably justifiably use force, that does something to the psyche of a human being. And, and sometimes that sense of I can do this and I have this badge and I have this authority, no matter how, what you, who you are and what, you've, what your background is, sometimes that, that, that can begin, that can be a powerful force inside of people. And so my, my, my best advice to someone is to figure out how to counter that with ensuring that each one of those folks have, have, are, can engage and, and relate and integrate with the good things that are going on in our community so that they see what's good about our community. In fact, I'm writing a letter right now that I'm just, I'm letting our, our, my goodbye letter at some level and I'm saying, one of the things I'm saying is, is do your best to become ambassadors for what is good in our community. And, and so that's the part that I think all police needs to work on. We're pretty good at the enforcement thing. We can, we can do that well. But what we're not really good at is uh, not, we're, we're faceless. Oftentimes police departments are faceless entities. We live in this fortress like we're, we're not, we don't, personalize ourselves and that would be the advice that and you have to constantly work on that because the psyche of of a person doing this job can be it, it can be it can be harmed uh, the psyche can be harmed by the nature of the work and so you have to set it up in a way so that our police officers are have access and and, and can see 
the good of what's going on in our community. Now that's that's a kind of a philosophical approach, but that can look like a thousand different things too. And so, and to constantly be monitoring them. And the other thing, of course, I think the big deal in policing are is found in the people that become police officers. Your recruitment and hiring has to be as tight and as good as it can be in terms of ensuring that you have the right people doing doing that job. Uh, and so I'll leave, I'll leave it at that, Tim. There's probably a, actually I'm Rob Spenlow and I are going to have a two hour conversation tomorrow and I'm going to I'm going to let him know a lot of things as well. And part of that's just what I said. So and, and to Mike's point, I asked the same question and I've got several pages of things <laughs> um, because he did do that for me. One of the things I wanted to point oh, out, that's right. and this is always a testament, and again, something I learned in other communities, is how does um, a police chief respond to when you want to see certain things? Um, last community I was in, they had an elected police chief. So that was an interesting situation. Um, I've shown up at multiple SWAT incidents. Mike's called, said this is going on. I go, I want to go look at it. He's never attempted to stop me. Um, <laughs> I've routinely called and, and said, hey, I'm free this afternoon. Can I do a ride around? They pick somebody who's available. They don't place me with someone. I just go with someone. Um, the openness is also a very clear indication to me when they don't try to match you with certain individuals. And so you get a certain story. Um, you know, that's huge in, in terms of how you approach this. Um, in, in a lot of cases, it's not what you do when you're being watched. It's what you do when you're not being watched. And, and those guys know, and Mike knows, um, as I'm driving around, I see stuff. I will stop and talk to them. And the example I will give you of, of what really happens. One day, one Sunday morning, I was going to get breakfast. Um, and... One of my favorite places um, is just down the street from where I live in the, um, where the old Kmart used to be. And there was an individual in the parking lot that was creating havoc. And um, police officer showed up, watched it, picked up my breakfast, drove around, came back, watched it. Another officer showed up. They were there 45 minutes just talking to the individual. They didn't have a clue that I was sitting there watching it. They didn't know anyone else was watching it. And for me, I think I called Mike and said, I just wanted to let you know what I just saw. Again, it's, it's not what you do when you know the city manager's with you or he's there. It's what you do when I'm in the parking lot and you don't know that I'm there. Um, and that was for me, one of those moments where you just go, they get it. And, and it was neat to see them just having the conversation. And at the end of the day, everyone walked away. I don't think they got within two feet of the individual. Um, and that was good to see because that's the culture that he's trying to build or that he's been working to build and we, we've got to continue. Again, we both said, we don't do it right all the time, but I will tell you, Mike owns it. Can I just kind of reinforce what, I, what you said here at the beginning of that, that you've received a couple of pages of, of thoughts from Mike. Mike's gonna spend time with his successor, or at least the interim tomorrow. I think part of what the reason for my question that, that not that I'm not curious about the direct answer, but the community, I think, also needs to know that Mike, that Mike Butler recognizes it's not perfect. There's growth right. to do. There's work that still has to be done. As far as this department's come, there's always going to be opportunities for improvement. And that's what it sounds like Mike suggested to you. That's that's what's important. to me. Yep. Right. Council Member Peck. So I just want to say that um, the fact that we don't have very many uh, resident complaints is a testament to Mike Butler and the way you manage the organization and uh, the, the standard that you set. So I don't think you're replaceable, but we can try. Can we clone you? Thank you very much for all of your effort. Uh, Thanks, and Chief, I want to echo those thoughts. Thank you very much for your, your thoughtful comments tonight and for what you're doing. And uh, it, it's it, there's so many uh, uh, scenarios and, and situations right now. We, we live in a very different world, and uh, we appreciate your effort to keep us safe. We really do. 
You're welcome. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you, everybody. All right. Later, Mayor. Chief. Um, I just wanted to say something on top of that. I wanted to thank Mike for giving me more time. You know, his his retirement date was what a month ago. Maybe. And yeah. And um, with everything going on, he hung on. And I think, you know, that's a piece of this. But what I wanted to say to you all is just generally, I think what we expect of the entire organization, this is as much for the community as, as it is for the organization. Um, and you know, when I saw this, um, I was horrified, um, physically sick. Um, it was criminal. The other officers were complicit. And those are pretty direct words. Um, but for me, it was different because I don't talk about what's happened in my life before, but it brought back, brought back memories of when I've had to deal with issues. Um, but the hardest part was having to explain it to my kids. Um, and it was the hardest conversation I've ever had to have. And I have a 16 year old and a 17 year old. And you know how many hard conversations you have with them and then trying to talk to them about what is different here than what they're seeing on the TV and, and, and getting them to understand that because what they see is what's all over the place and really having to talk to them about what goes on here. And my two are fortunate because they have interacted with many folks. They bowled with Mike at the employee get together. And so they have a different perspective. Organizations, and departments don't get here overnight. They don't get into that position. And there were things that you've heard about Minneapolis, a simple fact. A few years ago, 50% of the time their body worn cameras were turned off. And they said, it's gotten better. It's at 85% now. I mean, that's a, an interesting fact for me. Mike spent a lot of time with organizational culture. We've spent a lot of time with organizational culture, hundreds of hours. Um, where Mike and I've jointly taught classes. I've taught classes with every director I have. But what I wanted to let the council know, um, in those conversations, we talk about what we expect in terms of how we deal with each other, what we expect and when individuals deal with the community. Um, and now we've added um, equity into the conversation. That's the new ad that we're bringing forward. I just want you all to know from my perspective, zero tolerance for this. And I know Mike's the same way. And to, to council member Peck's comment, um, we deal with these issues quickly. And I will tell you, and in my career, I've had a, a situation where someone put a swastika on a board or uh, a minority employee, and I dealt with it that day. I've had members of my organization had to deal with um, um, well, I don't even know how to describe it. Um, racist groups that were part of the organization. They dealt with it that day. Um, I have zero tolerance for it. And what we've said to our organization, treat people like you want to be treated. And, and we will deal with it if you don't. That's my commitment to you all. That's my commitment to the organization, but that's also our collective commitment to the community. And if people have issues, they can call Mike anytime, they can call me. What I can tell you is we'll deal with it. All right, that's a great exclamation point to conclude the discussion. Thanks, Harold. Thanks, Chief. Let's, okay. move, on. Let's move on to first call public invited to be heard. Don, I don't, uh, how many, how many got in the queue? Mayor, we'll need to put that slide up and then take a break for four minutes or so. All right, so. let's let's go. Let's uh, be back in four, please. All right, see Thank you soon. You.
Thanks, Doc. If everybody can hear me, let's get back to our computers and move on to first call public invited to be heard. Don, how many just how many how many how many folks are in the queue? Mayor, it looks like we have two in the queue, and I just want to make sure uh, Susan is ready. She had a computer issue just a second ago. Susie, are you ready? Oh, Susan. Susan, okay. yeah, sorry, thank you. We still want Susie also. Both. <laughs> hey, Don, uh, my other computer is coming back up, but I am on another computer, and I do see that we have two callers. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay. So I'll go ahead and admit them. Um, Let's go ahead. The timer is on and going. I mean, not going, but ready to go. <laughs> Very good, Mayor. So for the first caller, your phone number ends in 637. I'm going to unmute you. If you could please state your name and your address for the record. Can you hear this? Hey, yeah. I also... Last time I listed my address, I had somebody show up at my house unexpected because they heard me on city council. You don't need to stay at it. It's not I, I mean, we, okay. we asked for it, but don't, don't worry about it. Okay, thank you. Um, so good evening, city council. I'm calling again this evening about short-term rentals. Last week I called in about the house behind us. And since then we have had to call the police about the noise ordinance and Airbnb guests being up and partying past midnight in our residential neighborhood. Also, since I last called, a house on my street, one house over, has begun operating as an Airbnb. This house is a stone's throw away from the house behind me. And I'm so upset that my neighborhood is being infiltrated by these Airbnbs. Um, my neighbors own another home in Longmont that they live in full time. So they are legally able to rent out the house on our street year round. Please reconsider your Airbnb rules and regulations. They are ruining our neighborhood and affecting the housing crisis and upsetting peaceful neighborhood communities. What can you do to support homeowners in Longmont? We need real change now. Thank you. Mayor, could we get right, that caller you. to state her name? I did not catch her name. Could you state your name, please, ma'am? Yeah, sorry. Yes, my name is Pearl Spinharney. Thank you, Pearl. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, let's go on to the second. One moment. Our next caller, your phone number ends in 820. You're unmuted. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Hi again, my name is Catherine Baylog and I live at 19, 1920 Spruce Ave. Last week I called in about the house behind me, 1883 Arapaho, which is the short-term rental Airbnb that sits in my backyard. I informed you last week of what we had been dealing with and just a couple of hours after I called last week into you all, I had to call the police because the people that were renting the Airbnb were outside partying in the hot tub, loud, smoking pot at 10.30 p.m. I also texted the owner of the house at, the at that time um, to ask him to please ask his guests to not be out there. The noise ordinance starts at 10 p.m and to inform future guests to please stop using the hot, hot tub and be out after 10 p.m. as well. And I got no response from him. I again had to call the police at midnight on the same night because the loud partying in the hot tub and smoking pot did not stop. Even after the police were called and they came the first time, they had to come a second time. Again, City, City Council, I would like for you all to revisit the Airbnb short-term rental laws in the city of Longmont. My neighbors and I do not think it's fair that we have to put up with a hotel with different guests every single week partying on vacation in our backyards. What can you do to help us with this situation? Do we have to have different partiers on vacation every week in our backyards? Please help us by revisiting the Airbnb short-term rental laws in the city. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Is there anyone else in the queue? No, Mayor, there is not. 
All right, and then let's move on to the consent agenda, an introduction and reading by title, first reading of ordinances. Could you please uh, read those, Don? You bet, Mayor, item 8A is appoint and reappoint affordable housing technical, technical review group members for 2020. And 8B is authorized mayor to sign a letter to the regional transportation district regarding the retention of fast tracks internal savings account dollars to unfinished fast tracks corridors. All right, do we have a motion? All right, Councilmember Peck. Actually, I would like to pull the uh, the letter. Was that B? That, that's fine. I'll go ahead and move item 8A, appoint okay. and reappoint affordable housing technical review group. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, I can do it. All right, it's been moved by me and seconded by Councilmember Peck. All in favor of 8A, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right. Passes by majority vote. Councilmember Peck. Um, yes. Uh, th first of all, thank you, uh, Mayor Bagley and Phil Greenwald for drafting that letter to uh, to uh, Paul Paul Baggard. Um, I want to explain that the Fast Tracks internal savings account has been used as a slush fund for any time that RTD gets out of trouble over the years and. It is the consensus of some elected officials who've been doing this far longer than I have that had that FISA account not been touched, we would have, and been invested, we would have enough money to finish all the unfinished corridors and we wouldn't have to constantly be having this fight. So that is the reason for this. But I would like to make a suggestion and perhaps an amendment on the letter. Um, the content is great, thank you so much. But uh, the reason that I asked for the mayor to uh, endorse this letter or to come up with a letter is because this Thursday is RTD board is meeting uh, to uh, actually start discussing the budget and the FISA is going to be on that meeting right away. So even though Paul Ballard is the interim, interim director he is not really the one who is going to be making the decision as to what to do with that FISA account. It will be the board of directors, uh, their consensus and their motion as to whether to use it for operating income or, uh, or to leave it as is untouched. So um, I would like to move that uh, item eight, was it eight or nine? I, I can't see it on my screen. It's eight B. Eight B with the amendment that we address it also to all the board of directors, all the RTD board of directors and uh, Paul Ballard as just respectfully because he is the director. I'll second that. Thank you. All, all right, all opposed say aye. Aye. Oh. Actually, any debate or discussion? All right, you all opposed. opposed. Yeah, you said opposed? opposed. Oh no, all, all, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, aye. Opposed, aye. All right, it passes unanimously. Thank um, you. All right, sorry about that. The uh, It's been a long day <laughs> and uh, we're on WebEx and I, anyway. All right, uh, let's go ahead and move on to, uh, we had one more, we had a report, I thought a sustainability evaluation system. There we are, let's move on to that. Good evening, Mayor. Can you hear me? Uh, members of Council, my name is Don Burchett with Planning and Development Services. And I have a short presentation for you tonight with an update on the SES sustainability system. And I wanted to go over that really quick. And while that's being put up, I also wanted to let you know that in attendance tonight, we have Lisa Knobloch, the sustainability program manager, as well as David Bell, the Director of Parks and Natural Resources, in case there's any additional questions related to the, uh, to the SES. So next slide. As noted in your council communication, staff has been working on the council, on, with council on a number of these items that have all culminated in an SES evaluation system. This system will be applied to any variance to a setback from the riparian areas, streams and creeks, and wetlands. And to date, 
we have completed the following tasks. We've updated the land development code to require council review of variances to the setbacks. We've updated the development code to require that an SES evaluation be completed. We have created an SES evaluation process for our development review committee, which includes staff from natural resources and from sustainability. And we have also finalized the SES checklist. With the completion of the SES checklist, the SES has been fully implemented and is ready for use on any variance requests that we receive moving forward. Next slide. So what remains to be completed? Based on council's past direction, we have a third set of code revisions that we need to process and bring forward. They will generally do the following things. First is that they will add some water bodies that to the to the riparian setback requirements for 150 foot setback from those. The areas that we are looking at would include portions of what's called the slough, which is spring gulch number one, spring gulch number two, dry creek number one, and lichens gulch. The second amendment that we're seeking is to with the code revisions is to implement the recommendations in Appendix A of the Wildlife Management Plan update. As you may recall, Appendix A of the Wildlife Management Plan recommended that the development code be updated and have updates completed to sections 15.05020 and 030. And those are related to the protection of rivers and streams and habitat and species protection. Next slide. So finally, what are our next steps? Currently staff is finalizing the revisions to the land development code, specifically those that were referenced on the previous slide related to adding those water bodies and making the revisions to the land development code that were recommended in Appendix A. That's currently undergoing a staff and legal final review that we hope to have completed here relatively soon. With that in mind, our goal for council direction as we understand it is that you would then look at any proposed revisions to the development code at a study session and we are currently trying to make a July meeting for that discussion. That's where city council would be updated on the changes that we're proposing to make and be able to give us any additional direction that you may need in order for us to achieve your goal. If the direction that we get from council does not require many changes or revisions to the document, we are currently shooting for an August 1st reading then of the ordinance for those amendments. And Mayor, that concludes my presentation. And if the council has any questions or things that they'd like to ask us or direction, we would take that at this time. I don't have any questions other than just saying thank you, uh, Dr. Waters. Thanks, Mayor Begley. Uh, thanks, Don. Um, Don, the, it, what you didn't, in the materials we got from Don a, a few hours before the meeting, uh, we basically, we got, uh, we received from Don the, the slide presentation, the deck you just did, uh, but the last slide in that deck, you didn't, you didn't present in your presentation. Uh, it, it, it lays out SES 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, that slide. Councilman Waters, is that the slide that we presented to the council, I believe back in November that has yeah. the, it's small on my sheet, I'm sorry, yes. it has three columns? Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah. Uh, is that still, or is that this, does this still represent kind of the phasing or staging of the work? And if it does, uh, I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to track, uh, it looks to me like we would be in July or August at the first part of 3.0, maybe not, but that's where we're talking about code updates. So the, 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 let me get the larger vision so I can read it. I apologize. Here, here's what I was really after, Don. I, I, I'm not trying to pin you on, on that thing, just, you know, necessarily on anything, but just to understand where we are, in terms of what was laid out then in the kind of bigger picture in the flow of the work 
So I could make middle notes or drop it onto my calendar, what I might expect to see regarding the SES at key times. July, obviously, if, assuming, well, regardless what the format is, uh, that we'll get an update and a chance to act on an ordinance in August, um, uh, which, would, which would partially update, it sounds like, the land code. Yes. That's correct. Um, and then, and then, what's the next phase? And the next phase uh, over the course of the rest of this year and the next year, um, I just, you know, we've been talking about this for a while. I just would like to make certain we, we get this done while I'm still on the council, and um, and I'm certain that's true for some other members of the council as well. So, being able to think about how this applies to a calendar would be real helpful. So, hey, Don. Um, Council Member Waters, I want to share the screen just because you brought it up for the public. Council Member yeah. Waters, is is this the is this the one you're it referring is. Yeah. to? Yes, yes. Don, this is the graphic. Okay. So I would say that everything in SES 1.0 is completed. The SES 2.0 will finalize the recommendations in the wildlife management plan. So that would come with this last set of land development code revisions that we would be bringing to you hopefully in an ordinance in August, assuming the July study session goes well. And as council expressed at one of the meetings, and I, I do not remember which one that the, rec the motion was made, but council chose to push off the 3.0, the one for public-private partnerships and for the riparian uh, adjacent discussion, expanding its impacts or onto other development to a future time. And that, as I, as I read the minutes and looked at that meeting, it looked like we would need you to make a motion for us to start working on those next portions that would cover 3.0. So on just, so it's somewhere in 2.0, what you're bringing us in July and August shows up in, is it in the last, is it in the additional standards? Cause we've already approved the standards. So I don't know if Harold could put that back up again easily. Yeah. Hold on. Hold on. Because we went through the additional waterways. The riparian discussion step two is, I think, what you're referring to, Don, when we looked at the red, green, and uh, red, yellow, and green areas and uh, how this applies and when it applies. And, 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 and I think that was in, in number two in 2.0. That right. that, and that's what we decided to, to wait on. Uh, and maybe it's, maybe this is just old enough that it doesn't represent what the kind of current flow is. That's what I was just trying to track. Yeah. So so the only thing that is still to be done are is step four under 2.0, the additional standards. So the additional standards are again are the items that were recommended in Appendix A of the Wildlife Management Plan update. Specific code revisions to those two sections that I talked about okay and that's the last step and we've been working on those since november and with everything that's happened this is just where we're at yeah okay but, but we're finalizing those to get those up to you here in july at a study session so we can wrap that up and then and then the right time to talk about the the broader implications the other legs of the stool the other how to think about the yellow and red areas in the waterways all the rest of it Yes. All right. Yeah. Thanks. That's, I'm, I'm good. All right. Thank you, Don. We appreciate that. And we look forward to the next step. All right. Appreciate Thank it. You, Mayor. Thank you, Council. All right. Let's move on to final call public invited to be heard. Let's take uh, two minutes and put that up on the screen and see if anybody calls in. We won't take a break because if we just sit here patiently for two minutes, I suspect no one will call in and we'll be done. Whereas if we take a break, it'll take 10 minutes and we'll be here longer.
All right, is there, is there anybody in the queue? Don, Susan? No, Mayor, not yet. It just started showing up on the screen. It's been about a minute. All right, we'll give it another 60 seconds or so. All right, is there anybody in the queue? No, Mayor, not at this time. All right, let's go ahead and move on to Mayor and Council comments. I'm not seeing all Council, but let's start with Councilmember Christensen. She hasn't, we, we haven't heard from you much tonight. Uh, Councilman Waters wanted to speak, though, earlier. So, Councilmember Waters, why don't you go ahead? Okay, I appreciate the difference. Uh, before I, I do have a statement I'm going to read before I do um, I've had on honestly I've had on my kind of list of items that I think we ought to to, to review is our ordinance on Airbnbs we continue to hear about it we get correspondence about it I know it's an issue you know one more thing that we would be adding to an already uh, tough agenda I just I think we owe it to our residents to review uh, that ordinance and and, and not just you know, what we're doing with it, but how we're monitoring and, and, and enforcing the, the ordinance. Number one. Number two, I know we delayed the uh, discussions about RVs uh, because of safe lots and what was going to happen with this. But in my notes on August 6th, or I'm sorry, yeah, August 6th, 2019, almost a year ago, 10 months ago, uh, we voted, gave direction to staff to bring back the RV ordinance for review and potential revision. Lots has happened since. I understand the reasons for the delays, but um, I don't know where we stand with safe lots. We heard the, the presentation in February or March. It's my impression that RVs were not gonna be part of any safe lot proposal. And so that still has, hangs out there after having given direction. We haven't done anything with it. And I think we owe it again to, to residents, whether you're in an RV or, or not in a home, I think we owe it to folks to, to, to take another look at what we ought to be doing with that ordinance as well. So I'm not, I'm not making motions on either of those. If somebody wants to pick it up and make a motion, we already gave direction on the, on the, on the RV. It would be giving direction a second time. So um, I'm going to make a statement, and if you'll just indulge me. Uh, uh, and I just, like so many other people, uh, I've been at a loss for words to express my reactions and reflections on what has been transpiring today across the country. Because the feelings I, I have are hard to express because it's felt like this is a time when people like me should do more listening than talking or speaking. I haven't made any public statements uh, about what we've been witnessing and, and how repulsive it is. This said, I just don't feel I can let, I, I can let this public meeting uh, come to closure without without making a statement. It just seems now is not the time for silent allies. So with that said, words like horrified, appalled, outraged, heartbroken, sad, or shocked feel less than adequate to express my reactions to the murder of George Floyd. So rather than trying to express those feelings, I just want to be on the record with where I stand on a number of issues or a number of points. Number one, I stand with all who seek justice for George Floyd, George Floyd, Mike Brown, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Aubrey, and so many others whose lives were ended by racial hatred and the people who per perpetuated uh, on this country. I stand with all who are committed to disrupting systems and dismantling structures that continue the stain of racism and social injustice in this country. I stand with those committed to creating a more just society in a nation through hard work collective action, compassionate action, and perseverance. I stand with those seeking a post-pandemic future 
this more equitable, distributed, balanced, sustainable, generous, healthy, and fair. I stand with Longmont's public safety team, all of our first responders, and the city's policies and approaches to policing that value prevention, service, health, safety, and the respect of our residents. I also stand against abuse of power, the misuse of force by police, the, the dehumanizing of people and disregarding of the rights of anyone, especially citizens or non-citizens of color in this country, to their life, liberty, equity, justice, decency, respect, health, safety, and security by those we entrust with protecting these rights in this country. I stand against those who have attempted to hijack, pervert, and corrupt a peaceful and principled mission to change the system and hold the people in it accountable. I condemn the lawless, senseless, destructive violence some people have perpetrated on Americans and their communities. I understand my words tonight will change nothing, but how I spend my days and my nights as a council member might make a difference. Well, I can't do anything about what happens in Minneapolis, Louisville, Ferguson, Washington, DC, or any other city in this country. What I can do, and what I'm going to do tonight is reiterate my commitment to working with others on this council, with members of the city staff and all Longmont community members to make this city more just, equitable, fair, inclusive, transparent, healthy, sustainable, and accountable. And if every council in every city in the United States does the same, it's my best hope that we never find ourselves again where we are tonight in this country. Thanks. All right, thanks, Doc. Councilmember uh, Council Christensen and Councilmember Martin. Sorry. Um, thank you, Councilman Waters. That was a good statement. And I also agree that we need to um, uh, re-examine the um, short-term rentals uh, and see how they're going. We need an update and we need to reconsider whether some of the things that we allowed are still uh, a good idea. Um, I do think that, I, I thank uh, Councilman Hidalgo Faring for her wonderful uh, statement. Um, I, I think it's incumbent upon everyone to speak up about this everywhere they can. And um, I think most of us know that um, policemen have a difficult job. They see and deal with things that would uh, make most of us, that would cripple most of us but they do it anyway. We know it's hard, but you still have to be a good man. You still are, and a good woman. Um, as um, Chief, Chief of uh, Sheriff Swanson said from Genesee, California, who marched with the, with the uh, things, with the protesters and uh, threw down his baton. He said, when this happens, it makes all the hard work that we have done absolutely useless. We have spent so much time trying to get, trying to build trust with the community. And you can't have a police system or anything, any kind of civilization without trust. And so then when you spread the seeds of distrust like this, not just distrust, but they murdered this man, they murdered him. <laughs> and Chief Butler has spent many, many years building trust in this community. Remember, two Latino men in the 70s were killed on Main Street, were shot to death by um, a police officer. And instead of exploding, the Latino community came together with the help of um, Navarro, Mr. Navarro and uh, Marta Moreno and Dan Benavides and a number of other leaders in the community to build something to fight back and give people a way to complain. But all that get, gets undermined when you have people who so shockingly abuse their power that they consider it their privilege to have life and death control over other people. We can't condone this. We can't allow this to happen. The first time I ever saw hatred 
I was a little girl and I saw a little girl, maybe a few older years older than me, walking up the steps to go to school. And she was black. She was very nicely dressed, much better than I ever dressed. <laughs> but there were all these adults screaming at her and screaming hatred. It was unbelievable to me. And my parents explained that to me, but she was protected by police officers. The poli police officers in a lot of these towns now are not protecting them and our president doesn't want them to protect them. He wants them to attack the protesters. This is not going to make things better. When you have chief people, people like Sheriff Swanson from Genesee and the Denver police officer and many other police uh, sheriffs walk with and talk with protesters, that's the beginning of changing things and making things better. When you have an attitude that people must be dominated and must be put down and must, be, that's exactly the problem. So I applaud all the people, all the police officers and all the peaceful protesters who are working hard to change things. We must change things in this country or we cannot go forward. Councilmember Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. I'll be brief because it's been my night to have my thunder stolen by other council members. But first, uh, to take a load off your conscience, um, Council Member Waters, um, I have been in communication um, with uh, Joni and Aaron. And in fact, we are revisiting later this summer the ordinances on short-term rentals and ADUs um, because of the new insights that we have been gathering over over time. And so we, we are getting our chance very soon now to do that. And I want the public to know that, that it's that watch for it. I don't have an exact date yet, but we are, we are, um, um, or rather our planners are, <coughs> excuse me, ready to come back to that. Um, the same with safe lots. I heard from uh, Joseph Zanovich of Hope that um, that the first safe lot is is set to open. It um, will not have RV facilities, but we will gain some experience with that. <coughs> Everybody's terrified of coughs. I just want to say there's nobody else around here. Um, <laughs> so uh, the last thing is that uh, uh, just to add a little bit, to Polly's story because it's an incredibly moving story and a story of possibility. Um, I knew before going into the weekend that Longmont has a different kind of police force from most cities and I wanted to do some research on just exactly how it got that way. I mean, I've uh, the, one of the first conversations, the first conversation I had uh, with Mike Butler was when I was running for running for office. Uh, somebody shot somebody in my house. I don't know. There was a loud noise. I hope you couldn't hear it. <laughs> I think it was a cat. Um, anyway, um, how how Longmont got to be the kind of city with the kind of police force that it has, and um, I learned the story of the very unjust shooting of two young Latino men. And it was actually 1980. So um, appropriately 40 years ago this August, uh, that will have happened. Um, and I asked Mike Butler, the first conversation I had, how you hire a police force and train a police force that doesn't act like that. And I was very happy that he told us. But I wanted to give a shout out, and Polly's already done it, to uh, El Comité because they came together with incredible speed and understanding and wisdom to know that they were protecting the whole community by giving themselves a voice and averting the violent reaction that could have happened because of that event. And um, I was just astounded that, that that could be done 
could be done by a bunch of ordinary people who got together because the community, the Latino community, which was only about 8,000 people at the time, uh, thought they were level-headed. Um, so they got this group of people together and, um, and that was the beginning of El Comité and the beginning of, of Longmont as a sane and inclusive community. So I was just so proud and happy to learn that story. Thanks. Uh, let's go with uh, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Uh, appreciate all the things that have been said so far by my colleagues here on council. I just want to say one thing as far as a lot of what I've seen in my network of folks who've been involved in protests all around the country, in the Deep South, in the Midwest, out in the, uh, the Pacific West, that uh, for people like us, it's easy to be able to make statements. We're elected officials. We have a little bit more of a, a, a platform that we can speak from. But I think it's really important that with some of these folks, we make sure that they know that it's their voice that needs to be heard. It's the people's voice that really needs to be heard right now, not so much our voices that need to be heard. It's more that we need to sit here and acknowledge that we are listening and we are receptive to what they're all saying and that I stand behind them and I will listen. And I plan to hopefully, along with uh, my fellow colleagues here, make the substantive change that people want to see as we go forward. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Doggle Ferry. Um, and so really, I want to add to just from my own experience, I've spent the last 30 years studying and presenting cultural proficiency, implicit bias, um, systematic, um, racism, institutional racism, and looking at how to break barriers. And a lot of the work that I do is um, working with individuals in changing that mindset and that shift from, and I think this goes back to um, when I heard Chief Butler talk about feeling, you know, guilty and just like this, I, I sensed a, a sense of guilt. And it's really moving away from that, um, from that sense of guilt and resentment to um, and reacting that way to more of a reflection and using that opportunity for growth. And I see that he, he utilizes that philosophy of, of um, the growth, um, reflection and growth in improving. Um, I, it's always disturbed me when I've heard people say, I don't have biases, I took an implicit bias training. I'm like, well, I've taken implicit bias for the last 30 years and I've, I train, but I still have biases and I still continue my education and grow and change. And the person I was 10 years ago is very different from the person I am today and what I'll be 10 years from now will look a lot different as well. And just, and just knowing, knowing that and really wanting to move our, um, from shifting that mindset from a tolerance towards diversity to really looking at a, and being committed to a transformation to equity. Um, so that was kind of in reaction to there. I do have some advice for people who are wanting to, to protest and get involved. You know, over the years, I've done a lot of uh, community organizing and working with organizations, Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and, you know, there, there are steps. It's keeping with the same message of who you're with, who you're rallying with, and stay with that cause. Um, make sure you have permission to be there. In some places, you need permits to be, to rally in those spaces. So make sure you're, you're adhering to those, um, those norms and, um, and um, regulations in, in um, being out there. And, and also to keep your, keep focused on the message, keep a unifying message and make sure that you're not um, getting riled up by instigators you know, there's a lot of people out there who are just looking to make trouble and causing mischief and causing trouble. We see it with the riots. And a lot of the people who started the protest were not the individuals who are engaging in the criminal activity. So if you're out there and you see this in cr criminal activity, do not engage with them. Call the police, you know, report those instances because it deters from the message 
that we're trying to, to bring forward. And this was something, so I marched with the Chicano movement in the late 80s and early 90s in Southern California in Chicano Park you know, near the Coronado Bay Bridge. And I, even back then it was, you know, don't get involved with the, there's going to be instigators. There's going to be people who are going to call you names and try to get you riled up to create problems. Don't engage. Um, and, you know, it's just because we, after all these years, we're still, I think when, when we look back in history, you know, or a hundred years from now, when people look back in history, they're going to view this time from the civil rights movement through here in a span that I think will last probably more than a hundred years as the um, civil rights movement. It's going it, to, it's going to expand for a long period of time. We're in it for the long haul. And, you know, my message is raise your children well, raise them to see justice in, in our, um, and compassion and empathy with our, with our neighbors and friends. So that was all I had to say. All right. I just, I just, just very short and briefly, I saw the video of George Floyd. I was disgusted and appalled. And uh, the one thing that uh, I keep, I keep thinking to myself is, um, as a society, I, I, what do you do to change the hearts of evil men, people who hate? And, uh, and uh, Martin Luther King, uh, I mean, uh, the vote, equality, anti-discrimination, he knew what he wanted to achieve legally. And um, I think a lot of the frustration we have now is what do you do to really change the hearts of evil men? And so um, I think the best thing right now, I mean, the one thing I know we can do is condemn it and be quite vocal. So I join all of you in condemning that. Um, it's just terrible uh, as we look at the world we're in right now. And uh, I still believe that there are more good hearts than evil hearts. And so I prove that I'm right. I, I just pray that I'm right. So that said, I don't see any other comments. Uh, city manager, I'm oh, sorry, Councilmember Peck. Thank you. I wasn't going to say anything because I agree with all of you, but uh, in, in remembering what that video was, that the murder was horrible, but what I really was frightened by was the look on the police officer's face when he had his knee on the throat of Floyd. Um, there was no empathy. There was no sympathy. There was no recognition in his face at all, that this was a human being, no consciousness. And that is the part that scares me about what is going on in our uh, society. So um, I think that talking, talking, talking about this and educating is what we constantly need to do. And um, you know, to Aaron's point or Mayor, uh, Mayor Pro Tem's point is that uh, yes, we do have a platform, I agree, but people need to hear what the leaders of the city think. Do we accept this? Do we not? Or whatever, which, which is not the message that we are getting from the national level. And I think for me, that is part of the biggest problem is that we, we have more power on the local level to actually talk to people rather than just giving statements. So thank all of you. I'm very proud of the statements we've made. And I think that we will go out and hopefully bring uh, some sense, consciousness, awareness to this horrible problem we've got in our country. Thanks, Joan. All right, Harold, do you have anything to say? Unmute, Harold. Two updates. Councilmember Martin gave one of them. Joni is working on that to bring the B, uh, uh, that item back um, uh, on the short-term rentals. Also, um, I know Karen and the group met, um, our self and welcoming places group met, uh, and particular focus was RVs, and that's being uh, prepared to bring back to you all. Uh, just so you know, we are seeing more issues and more significant issues. Um, and, and so they wanted to bring, uh, get that together. So that'll probably be hitting, um, I'm gonna say maybe late June, July. Um, Karen's also, and her group's also working on the LHA stuff, so we're trying to balance those two things. But it is on our radar, and um, there's, I, I've got to get brief from the last swaps meeting. Eugene? No comments, Mayor. Awesome. Uh, do we have a consensus motion to adjourn? Anyone opposed to adjourning? 
Who whoop. All right. I'm in, I'm going to go ahead and assume that's the consensus vote unless I hear objection. All right, we are we are adjourned. Thank you everybody. See you soon. Mm-hmm.